Right. Welcome, everybody, to the webinar about the truth about what it's like to live in a senior living community. Our next monthly session, we have these every first Thursday of the month. Our next one is Thursday, October 5th. And it is what documents you need to put in place before moving to a senior living community. And our next one following that is November 2nd, which is going to be planning for the holidays with older loved ones. I'm Paige Fairbanks Gunn, the Relationship Manager for Kelch Senior Communities in Arizona. I've been working with seniors um, since 1997 and have worked with over 4,000 families in my career. Kelch Communities operates in eight states and we are family owned and operated since 1958. We offer independent living, assisted living, memory care, respite care, and also daycare services. All of our assisted living memory care communities have a licensed nurse on site 24 hours a day. Kelch Communities offers exceptional care throughout, and we have so many resources, including our speaker today. Our speaker today is a national caregiving speaker and consultant. She provides a path to relieve the fear, anxiety, and overwhelm that family members experience when a loved one is diagnosed with dementia. She is the founder of Alzheimer's Family Consulting, a certified senior advisor, certified dementia practitioner, and a certified in dementia care. She is also the author of the highly rated It's Not That Simple, Helping Families Navigate the Alzheimer's Journey, which is based on Pam's 14-year dementia and Alzheimer's caregiving journey with her parents. Please welcome Pam Ostrowski. So much, Paige, and thank you to Kelch Communities for hosting this really important presentation, webinar, Q&A. Um, you know, we basically want to make sure that this is an interactive session and that you have the opportunity to ask the difficult questions. That's, we kind of tweaked the title. Originally, it was like all about senior living. And then we thought, well, actually, we kind of want to open our kimono or, or air our dirty laundry. You would pick your favorite uh, analogy or colloquialism. We want to let you know about the good, the bad, and the ugly, right? So we want, most of it's good, by the way. But if you have difficult questions, feel free to type them in. You know, we, we do understand this is a business of helping people live a better quality of life. So with that, um, we're going to, just like we did last webinar, is we're going to mix things up a little bit. And rather than me presenting uh, about my personal experience of um, basically we had eight years in senior living communities, both independent, well, actually independent assisted and memory care, two different memory care communities. So I'm intimately familiar from your perspective, the caregiver and the, my expectations and what I was looking for and how things worked out for us. And so uh, we thought that Paige and I could tag team and ask each other questions both answer from our perspectives, and then um, you can jump in at any time. Like I said, um, you know, put in the chat if you want to ask your question because it's longer and you don't want to type, which I totally understand. Then um, just uh, raise your hand using the reactions at the bottom, and um, or just type in there. I have a question, and then we'll open up your mic so that you can ask it. Okay. So, Paige, are you ready? I'm ready. Okay. The first question, and by the way, these are questions that we get from people just like you every single day. So the first one is, what's the difference between a home, which is what everybody says, don't put me in a home, I don't want to live in a home, uh, and senior living? So what's your response to that question, Paige? So there's lots of facets to that question. Um, the difference between a senior living and a home is... The scene, you've got your independent living, your assisted living and dementia care, and then you have skilled nursing. So there's different facets. So the senior living realm is lots of it's, it's going to start with your low maintenance living, uh, your consolidation of expenses, upscale living, which includes your independent and assisted and memory care, which is actually all levels you can have upscale living, uh, keeping in shape, a vibrant social life learning, growing, and traveling. Um, you've got care facets to it. And then you also have the nursing component. So there's all, that's a huge range of, of answers within that question. Yeah, that's, that's a great point. Now you're going to hear 
from Paige as the expert in all things senior living. And you're going to hear from me as the caregiver, the person who's experienced that. Uh, my mom was in a Kelsch community for three years in, uh, in Surprise, Arizona. So my response to that question when I get it is, well, first of all, when you move your person, you know, your loved one, or you move together to uh, independent living or assisted living, uh, you are not moving them into a home. That term is short for nursing home. Mm -hmm. And a nursing home, nine times out of 10, is for someone who has a medical reason, that needs additional care. Like it is the top level care. It's also the most expensive, uh, but it is skilled nursing 24 seven. And there's more than one nurse on staff to help with um, the, the patient's needs. And they are patients at that point. It is not memory care. Um, so if you have someone who has cognitive impairment, then they would go into memory, what I like to call assisted living with memory support because they're going to get help with tasks. So when we say home, that is skilled nursing home. That's what that's short for. So this hopefully helps you get through the whole, I feel guilty putting mom in a home. Well, you're not putting her in a home if you're moving into some sort of senior living community. So, all right, Paige, what's the next question? Why would I move into senior living when I can live at home at no expense? Oh my gosh. So uh, in my book, I go through this story and the book again is it's not that simple helping families navigate the Alzheimer's journey. And my dad was a pretty frugal individual. And so when uh, mom was, I could see mom was struggling and he asked this exact question. Why would we, we our house is paid off, our condo is paid off, we're close to everything. Why would we pay, go back to paying rent basically? And I said, well, it's not exactly rent. It's more than a box. It's more than a room. And it's, it's being around people. It's meeting new people, making new friends, socializing, eating dinner with other people, um, having conversations that are based on memories that you you have together in your cohort. Um, and and so there's so much more to it. And then there's things like what Paige mentioned. There's an exercise room. There's an activities director that makes sure that you're exercising. There can even be a, a gym manager, someone who makes sure that you're, he's or she is watching over how you're exercising to make sure you're safe. Um, there are... Uh, I know I talked about this last time, but I, I am so impressed at the park independent living. They have the most beautiful bar area. I mean, it is very high end. So you can have cocktail hour with your friends and, and meet new people and listen to an amazing pianist while you're sipping your, your um, old Manhattan or old fashioned. This is a lifestyle. It is not about oh, I'm getting old. It's about, hey, I finally deserve and, and, and want to live in an environment where I can be get more stimulation. The saddest thing is I have a client whose aunt is in a one bedroom apartment um, and she's always by herself. She gets up at three in the afternoon. She doesn't remember to take her medication. She goes back to bed by seven. And they never know if she's alive or gone. There's no care. There's nothing. And that is, to me, that's elder abuse because you're allowing that person. Now she's pretty resistant, um, but, but we have to work through those, those ways of having conversations where people see that this is, this is not the bad guy. This is the experience in the life that you deserve. So what about you, Paige? What do you, what do you think as far as, um, you know, why would you move in to senior living? With me, I work with so many families. To me, when you get to a certain age in life, why wouldn't you? Um, having, you know, the low maintenance living, um, the consolidation of, of expenses, that's huge. Um, oftentimes when we grow older, there's so much stress going on, dealing with the yard, having to deal with the, the pool guy, um, having to deal with maybe an older home that maybe you've lived in for 50 years. Why would you want to deal with those things? Um, having the freedom of being able to just live your you live your best life and not have to deal with all of these things. Um, having the safety and security of having someone on site 24 hours a day, 
um, you know, the safety, security, having transportation available. So you don't have to worry about driving to and from your doctor's appointments, letting people work for you. You've worked all your life. Why not somebody work for you? Um, also having the ability to stay in shape and have those social connections with people, um, life learning friendships, learning with other people, um, being with people that you, that you, you know, you've, you, you want to be around. Maybe you've, you've, you're on people that have been teachers all their lives or people that have been, um, traveling the world. Why wouldn't you want to be around people that you've been, that you would want to be with, um, in the future instead of just being alone. And I think a lot of it tends to be too loneliness helps it's, it's prevent loneliness. Exactly. Yeah. And depression. We, we um, learned that in COVID, right? Yep. And also the nutritional factor, you know, at the park, like you said, you know, we have a happy hour, we have a beautiful bar, um, dinners five nights a week. And I mean, these are dinners. I was at um, our independent living yesterday and surprise. And I mean, they're having oysters, Rockefeller, they're having fresh, fresh cut salmon. Um, we're having beef tips. They're having, you know, shrimp, all sorts of wonderful food that they can eat with and dine with, with other people and have that socialization. So for me, I say, why not? Yeah, exactly. It was funny when, uh, when we were touring for our first, uh, location, I, my parents had no idea what walking into uh, a, a community was like. And so they were kind of in awe, like, wow, this is not what we expected at all. And we walked into a room and it was a big room, a big um, uh, apartment with a big living room. And it had a little kitchen and a little dining space and then a nice one bedroom. And, you know, I told mom, I said, oh my gosh, you have staff, you have someone to do your cleaning. So house cleaning, Oof, boy, I would take that in a heartbeat. Um, you have someone to um, prepare your meals for you, someone to do your laundry, someone to, um, you know, watch over you, man medication management and that type of thing. And that was actually the trigger for, uh, uh, for dad to accept that we needed to move because mom would no longer accept his guidance in taking her medications. And then he was feeding her White Castle burgers and French fries that were you know, in soup. And so that wasn't going to work for her diet because she just recovered from colon cancer. So there's lots of reasons that nutrition thing is, is a big deal. We as human beings enjoy celebrating food, especially Americans. We love our food. And, and so to be able to have that experience was so helpful for them to be more socialized. So I, I wholeheartedly agree with you. Uh, okay. So next question, how many types of senior living are there independent or assisted or memory support we talked about? And then what's the difference between them as far as qualifying goes, you know, how do, how does that all work? Can you help us out with some of those details like licensing and, you know, how do you know which one to go into and that type of thing? Pam, like you said, there are so many different levels. Um, with your independent living, there you tour, you look at it. You know, if you are if you are a completely independent person and you're looking for transportation, socialization, um, the consolidation of expenses, um, and meals, independent living is definitely going to be you know an option for you. Um, assisted. Once you get into the assisted living realm, everything below that is all in a licensing environment. So once you step into assisted living and assisted means once there is a need of clinical, such as you are needing assistance from a caregiver. So for example, medication management, maybe mom needs help with a shower. Um, she's needing help with dressing, maybe some you know, bathroom assistance. She needs help to and from activities, those types of things, and needs a physician on site that is a traveling physician. Those are, you're stepping into the assisted living realm. Um, then memory care, same thing, everything and above and beyond that. But, and the memory care community is going to be, staff understands dementia. They understand that the residents, they need care that needs guided care throughout the day. They need task over task assistance for their activities of daily living. Um, and then your, your skilled nursing part is going to be 
where maybe they've gone into a rehab center. They've been in the hospital. They had a, they had a broken hip fracture. They've now gone to rehab and they need that nursing care to recuperate them back to where they can get into assisted living back to their home. Um, the, the differences as far as qualifying independent living, you don't need to qualify for independent living. Now, if there are a lot of needs that um, are arising during the, you know, the first visit of an independent living, they may say, you know what, you need more than what we can offer. You may need assisted living. Once you get into that assisted living realm, there is an evaluation that takes place, and that is done by a nurse, a clinical nurse. And the nurse will evaluate to see what are your daily needs? What type of assistance are you needing with your activities of daily living? And activities of daily living is bathing, dressing, toileting, med management, when do you get up, when do you go down to bed, those types of things. And what is kind of your daily routine? Same thing with memory care. And once that nurse does that evaluation, they will determine what level of care you qualify for. And assisted living can, can really take a whole realm of, of assistance and care and also memory care. Um, but they will determine what type of level of care that you will need. And they will bring back to you, okay, this is the assistance um, that we feel that you need. This is the level of care. Each community does have an assessment process. Every assisted living community across the nation has an assessment process. They will determine what your level of care is, which also equates to care points, which can include what the cost will be. Um, and each assisted living, memory care, and also skilled nursing, they're all licensed by the health department. So there is a licensing factor. Um, you can look up any sort of assisted living community nationwide and look up your state health department assisted living licensing to find out what their survey process is, um, what their survey looks like, and how they're licensed, how long they've been licensed, how many and if any deficiencies they have. Um, so there is a qualifying process once you step into that assisted living realm. That's excellent. And so can you just help clarify, I'm going to drop in here, and this is also in my book, an example, but there's the Arizona Department of Health Services. And so whatever yours is, you can just Google it and you should be able to find your um your specific state's safety and survey survey of communities. That was something that I did in researching for mom and dad uh, because I wanted to see, because that's where you find out how many penalties and violations are there. So, and then you get to decide, is that a big violation? Like if somebody, you know, ended up, um, I'm trying to think of, you have a bruise. Okay. So mom would get bruised and this happens when you're, when you get older and your skin gets thinner, um, if someone was trying to pull her up to go to the bathroom and they didn't, you know, they were pulling her and her weight was dead, she might've gotten bruised. And so that's not abuse. That's a medical situation where we need to get two people to help her get up now because we're realizing that where she is bruising more. And honestly, that would not be something that I would look at as being a huge infraction of, of a community. Um, and so you, you, in this, this decision of what's it really like to live there, you have to decide for yourself, what, where do you draw those lines? So can you explain a little bit about the points system? Like, could you give some examples of, um, needs that would attribute to a points level, like entry level, mid-level, high level? Yes. So um, with our assessment process, and just like many, um, I, I worked in this industry for 25 years, and all of them do, like I said, have a point system. Um, it Everything's based on the care need. So for example, let's say my mom comes into assisted living, and she needs med management, and she needs assistance with five medications. Um, then I have maybe my dad that's coming in, and dad is diabetic, and he had, he's on 11 medications, but he also needs to be, you know, checked for blood sugars three times a day. He's on a sliding scale, um, insulin. And also he is needing more assistance with hands-on heavy care, like transfers. Those are all going to equate towards more points. So mom's going to be more 
more in the level one to two care versus dad's probably going to be in that maybe level three range. And each community does have a perimeter. Now, whether they break that down into costs for you, they each all have a perimeter of level of care scoring. So the more care they need, the more points are equated, which equals more staff time, which could also turn into, you know, more care costs um, because everyone's at a different, everyone's at a different range. Right. And everybody's unique. So each person gets assessed on that. One of the things that we did is um, dad was independent and he didn't want to move because he thought he was fine. And, (laughs) and for the most part he was, Uh, but mom needed care and he didn't want to leave her. He didn't want them to be separated. So when we looked for senior living, we were looking for a senior living community that would keep them in the same apartment. So they had ended up with a two bedroom apartment with a small kitchen, a living room and yeah, two ba- two baths too. I mean, it was, I felt like it was a house. And <laughs> when you walked in and uh, they, uh, he was independent. So, you know, caregivers would know his name and everything, but he was not, they were not going to provide him with any help with medication, medication management or anything. Cause he really didn't need it. But for mom, she went in as assisted living because she was living with him. So he was kind of, he would do her reminders and her cues for meals and, and um, you know, be, walk with her if they were going to, you know, go down and play pool at the pool table or something. So he was always there. Um, but then when her um, dementia progressed, all they did was move up one floor. He at that point needed assisted living. So again, as you as the evolution of your life changes, you don't really want to go and look at a different community again. So you look for something, at least we did. This was important to us. It may not be important to our listeners, but it was important to us to have a place that could evolve with care as we progressed up the care needs spectrum. And so then mom had uh, memory care support and, you know, additional help uh, that she needed at the time. And so things did get more expensive, but not by a lot. Like, you know, when you think, oh my God, level three, you know, that's going to be a million dollars. And it's like, no, no, it's, it's a, and every community is different. So I know we have people from all over the country, but it's, it's the same concept that you can apply to your living situation with your loved one. One thing I wanted to talk a bit more about, if you would help me out, Paige, is I have clients. I was just, uh, I was speaking at the Certified Senior Advisor Conference uh, a couple of weeks ago. And there was a gentleman sitting there and he said, you know, my mom's 98 years old and I'm calling the community and, you know, I can't get a hold of them. And she sounds like, you know, she doesn't sound good. And I said, is she, which level of care she's in assisted living? And he said, no, she's an independent. And I said, well, they're not going to help her because she's signed up for independent. At 98, whether she needs it every day or not, you should have her, you should be paying for and getting caregiving where we can, somebody can watch her because he lives three hours away from her and the daughter is off on vacation. This poor thing is by herself with no help whatsoever because she's an independent living. Um, So how would you, how can you clarify, um, you know, why, why that would be the case or how can we clarify to people so that they understand independent living is heavy on the independent part? Right. Yes, absolutely. And that's a great question because I, there seems to be, you know, a lot of confusion. Um, So when you are searching for communities and you feel your loved one is maybe on the cusp between independent and assisted living, you want to be sure you're not picking a standalone independent living. So there are differences. So for our communities in Arizona, the parks, they are standalone independent living. We are not licensed for assisted living. We are not licensed by the healthcare department, period. We're independent living. So if if you're wanting to move your loved one into our community at the park and you're expecting us to check on her, that is not a service that we're going to be doing. So for him, for you know, your, your gentleman that you are working with, he mm-hmm. should have, or maybe he already has her mom in this type of situation, needs to ask for it. He needs to have his mother in a community that is an independent living, but is licensed as assisted. 
So there's a difference because independent living can be standalone by itself. But if you are on the brink of needing a little bit more care and you think care is going to be, you know, pretty near down the road, you need to pick a community that has assisted living integrated into the independent, meaning they're all licensed as assisted living, but mom can come in independent, but once she needs that care, there's care staff that is available for her. There is a big difference. So if you are looking for independent living and you are, you know, you're thinking that possibly there's going to be a, a care need down the road, then you want to make sure that you're picking something that has assisted inside of it. And like yeah. I said, with ours, ours is so independent. We're looking for the very we're our our independent livings are looking for the very vibrant, very independent, active adult right. that is probably going to be an independent, you know, independent living for, you know, three to five years versus sometimes we get a lot of people that come into our door and they are way past the independent living stage and they need assisted care. And we do have to turn people away or we let them know you can be in the independent living community, but you're going to have to get help that comes in, you know, to help you either right. non-medical or a sitter type service that's going to help you, which right. then again, you know, you got to weigh out the, the cost. Yeah. Because yeah. I think a lot of a lot of our seniors are waiting much longer. So by the time they come to us, um, yeah. they're beyond the independent stage and they need assisted. So that's a very good question. Because if he were to be in our community and he asked for us, why aren't we not checking on mom? We wouldn't be checking on mom. We're making sure she's getting her meals. She's getting her housekeeping done. You know, we see her in activities. Um, she has transportation, those types of things, but we would not be checking on somebody in independent living. That's yeah. assistance. And, yeah, and that's that's the reason why I picked the community. Well, I guess we picked the community that we did is because if dad all of a sudden wasn't feeling well, had a cold, he had caregivers because we would just switch his plan to assisted living. And and some places allow you to switch the plans back and forth. You do, how often do you do a eval of, of care needs? Is it monthly, quarterly, annually? We do, well, our company policy is we do monthly. Um, that's okay. in our assisted we living and memory care. But the standard is quarterly in memory care and um, in assisted living, what's mandated, what's re um, for the health department is every six months. And that's and fine. and or um, if there's been a significant change, right? Like and, hospitalization and to me, or something. That's that's. Uh, I would prefer, and and this is something that you guys can do. Is if I saw that Dad wasn't feeling well, I would immediately go to the nurses station or to the director of either independent assisted or memory care and say, okay, we need to up mom's or dad's attention for caregiving because he needs this help and he can't support mom or mom needs more help because dad isn't feeling well. So whatever that might be, you, you need to choose a community because this is about how, what's it like to live there. Well, most of it has to do with making sure that you're getting the services that you need whether or not you want to accept that fact that you you might need them sooner than later. We do have a question from Josh saying, what does memory care assistance entail? I usually see a modest jump from in dollars from independent to assisted, but a huge jump usually to memory care from the places I've looked at. So um, as, as someone who has lived this, Josh, my mom stopped speaking eight years before she passed. And that was because um, the amyloid plaques and tau proteins had attacked her brain and her speech centers. Then um, five years before she passed, she lost her ability to walk because again, it affected her mobility center. And so she was full on care. My mom was dead weight, just like every other human being. She was in a wheelchair. So one person can't pull a person out of a wheelchair to toilet them or to shower them. You need two caregivers. So you're taking two caregivers off the floor and at, for showering, for toileting, for dressing, any of those things, and that costs money. And then in addition to that, the quality of people that you're hiring. So this is the reason why I'm doing a presentation with Kelsch Communities and with Paige is that we went to Kelsch because it had highest level of certifications nurses on staff, real nurses, RNs. Um, that's why I, I, I've not looked up re registered nurse. I always just call them real nurses. That's what RN stands for in my head. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> but um, so you've got nurses on staff, seven by 24, 
And then you've got caregivers who are CNAs or are working on their CNA. You've got an activities director that has years of um, dementia activity experience, stays up to date on that type of thing, stays in touch with the families. And those are all really important elements of memory care. But hiring those people with higher level skills costs additional money. So that was how I looked at it. Paige, what's your perspective on the jump between assisted living and memory care? Well, it's, it's a, it is a huge jump. Um, and I'll tell you, assisted living staffing ratio is one caregiver to 30. Mm, there you go. Memory care is one to 10. So um, it, it is literally a, a labor staffing. It is you're hiring more people. There are more people on the floor, um, more people caring for your loved one. And once someone goes from assisted living to memory care, you have now equated the fact that your loved one obviously maybe at this point has no safety awareness. Okay. So they need someone with them at, to make every decision for them, how to get up in the morning, how to get dressed, how to go to the bathroom, um, when and when not, you know, when to eat, when to drink, are they being encouraged for hydration? Whereas assisted living, those things aren't happening because most of our, our, our residents in assisted living, they still have some capability of safety awareness and they do know how to call 911. Whereas once you, once you step into memory care, it is much more hands on deck and there is much more staff provided and it's, it's, it's a staffing, it's all staffing. Yeah. That's yeah. why. And, and you bring up a really good point because um, with nutrition in particular and hydration. So it is very common for someone who's living alone or living at their home of 50 years to get UTIs frequently. And yeah. even when you move into a memory care community where you're you're being monitored for your intake and fluids and, and food it can happen, right? Because oh, yeah. it's just, it's a natural thing, dehydration and, and you can't force someone to drink, right? So, which is unfortunate because hydration is so important for brain health. And so, but you have cues. And so I remember mom, they would stack, she would have, cause you never know what, what, what everybody wanted. So she would get cranberry juice, lemonade, iced tea. And, uh, what was the other one? Um, so, so she had like, and probably water. Um, so she felt like any of those, and then she would drink them all because she thought she had to clear her tray before, <laughs> before she finished. And that was great. Except that boom, she was first in line to get to the bathroom though, <laughs> because of all those fluids. So it's about, but, but the point there is, is the caregivers are watching. They're watching like, oh, Loretta emptied all four of these. We got to take her to the bathroom. And they're they're intimately familiar because of that ratio with the care of each individual and what their needs are, how they're feeling. Like the first person who knows knew that my mom would, you know, was getting a UTI would be would be the caregiver who would be like, hmm, she's moody today. And it turns out that emotions and sadness and moodiness actually is one of the first emotional indicators of a UTI. And so, and they were, you know, it's like, all right, let's get out a test. And, and that's the other thing the, they had tests, they had UTI tests. So they would do, take her into the bathroom be like, yep, she tested positive. Let's get some antibiotics in her bang, bang, bang from mm, something's wrong to diagnosis and a, a prescription for medication all within, you know, a few, just a couple of hours. That is not going to happen in assisted living. So we're talking about eyes on care when you talk about memory care and that costs money because it's so intense right and so that hopefully that answers your question josh i could talk about that one forever um one thing that you did mention uh page that i think is important for people to realize is when uh someone moves into independent living uh and even assisted living they can hire an in-home care agency a private caregiver to come in and provide services. There's nothing against you, your loved one, or you doing that. Um, you know, the, the difference is, is that the cost is, is more, it's more um, cost savvy or money savvy to have the caregivers and use the assisted living services within the community. One, they're already there, right? Um, because with the in-home care agency coming in, you usually 
get them for a block of hours. So maybe from 10 to two. Well, what if you needed them at eight in the morning or at four in the afternoon? And that it's like, well, that's your block of hours. You know, you, you've picked those and that they're not as flexible as you would, you would probably like to be regarded because they're trying to coordinate people. Um, or they'll say, well, the, we don't want our caregivers driving around. So we need, you know, they have to have an eight hour block. Well, which eight hours would you like? You know, so, so by using assisted living caregivers, um, and, and having a clear intent about what they're for, like, what do you want help with? And that's a conversation that they can have with their executive director and nursing staff, correct, Paige? Who do they talk to in the community? As far as the initial would be the, the director of, of care, the director of okay. nursing. Mm -hmm. Okay. All yeah. right. So that would be the, hey, we're noticing we need some help with this or that, you know, how, yeah. how can we coordinate those services? in addition to whatever we have today. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Sounds good. Wow. We ran with that one. Uh, <laughs> that's good. Thanks for the question, Josh. Okay. You're up Paige. You have a question for me. And I think, you know, I think he, he, we, we went over a lot of this, but uh, yeah. in his last question, it says there seems to be a lot of different communities offering the same services. What's the difference between them, staffing, certifications, location, budget for activities and outings? We talked about this yesterday uh, or day before. Um, yes, there seem there is a lot of communities offering the same services, but what are the differences between them? So um, I'm not going to take a drink of water. <laughs> so this is interesting because, uh, and I'll have ask you to provide your advice on you know how many communities do you look at, but I got a little frustrated and scared, frankly, in looking at communities, because I kind of felt like I'd go in, uh, you get the tour, which I, I prefer to have a conversation, but you get the tour. And, uh, and it just feels like a sales call, to be honest with you, the ones that I like the most, and this is what um, Stephanie did at, at Kelsch and Surprise, she's, you know, we sat down, and she's like, how are you doing? You know, how are things going for you? Because it is really about, I'm the one with all the pressure and the stress, because I'm the one trying to make a decision about my loved one. I may have siblings that are less than happy about this whole thing. And, and so I'm under a tremendous amount of stress. So having somebody who related to me as a human, especially at, at, at that level, to, to know that they cared about me meant that they were going to care about my mom as well and her well-being. And so um, uh, Stephanie always said, we are your support team. We are here to help you provide the best care possible for your mom. And that's our, our responsibility. And to me, that felt much better than, you know, well, here's our rates and here's, you know, here's what the rooms look like. I want people to think outside the box. And to me, the box is that bedroom they're sleeping in. Because to be honest with you, you're not going, they're not going to spend a lot of time there. And, and they shouldn't because all, if that's isolation, if you spend, I have, have one client who's like, I can't get dad out of the room. He's watching TV. So rule number one, it's probably best not to have a TV in the room because especially in memory care, absolutely not. No, no TV in the memory, in memory care rooms because they will sit and watch. They can't process what's there, but they're not taking advantage of the stimulation that they need for their brain. They're not getting a visual stimulation, audible stimulation, um, sniff, smells, right? So smelling, you know, we always had chocolate chip cookies and brownies and all those yummy things. Those are all wonderful stimulation uh, tools for the brain. And so when you look at these different communities, one of the things <laughs> that I always recommend against, and you guys might be shocked by this, is it's not about how close they are to, to family. It really isn't. Now, I'm not suggesting you put them in a different state, but, um, or, you know, maybe an hour away. But a lot of times, the first thing people do is they look for, okay, what's within a one mile radius of our house? Well, let's be honest, that may not be the best care for them. And this is about evaluating, talking to the director of nursing, talking to the activities director, talking to uh, even the executive director, the person who's responsible for the entire operation of the, the building and, and saying, well, what makes you different? You know, like, wh what is it that you, how do you perceive your community versus other communities that are out there? And how do you care for your love, you know, your, your residents um, and differently? 
And that's why I always encourage you to get the right questions. That's what I coach people on when I meet with them one-on-one. So it, it really does come down to don't base your decision on location. Um, you know, have a, you know, it, it could be as much as I would actually say a 15 or 20 mile radius because you're not going to visit every day, especially if they're in assisted living or independent. They don't want you bugging them. They're off having fun. So, you know, ha- allowing you to, to select a community that um, provides the best care is, the, in my opinion, the number one priority. Um, the other thing is, is to ask them about outings and budget uh, for activities. So one of the things that happens at Silver Creek um, that one of my clients was like, oh my gosh, I have to send you this picture of my dad with a baby goat. And <laughs> uh, what Silver Creek had done, and I don't know how you guys did this, but they had brought in zoo animals. Petting like zoo. Mm-hmm. It's a petting zoo. Okay. Mm-hmm. And, and so all the rest of, now, when, when you're in a situation where you can't do a lot, so this was memory care, you know, to see little animals is just watching, you know, your, your elders, you know, light up when they see a dog, a goat, a chicken, whatever it is, they're just so excited. And that's something Kelsch does. Not every community does that. So when I say ask about the type of activities that they have and what their activity budget is, not I mean, obviously not in dollars, but like how many activities do you have per month? Um, do you have a calendar that is you know scheduled that every month that there's the petting zoo or there's a therapy dog with it in every month or every week? Frankly, it should be every week. Um, and so those are the things that you're asking for. So if you're interested in um, us talking about your list, because it's a personal list, right? Uh, let me know. Um, I put my uh, email address, Pam, at it's not that simple.com, and you'll get it in my email addresses and the email reminders that I have sent out to you. Um, you know, let me know. And what, you know, I'm offering you guys a, a free 30 minute consult, and we can go through whatever questions you have for, for senior living based on my experience, as well as hundreds of my clients who are going through this process as well. So what about you, Paige? Anything like around certifications or surveys? Um, Uh, You know, when I'm, when I'm talking to people, I I always tell them, first of all, don't call the community and set up a tour. (laughs) I'm, I'm a huge believer in pop in unannounced. Um, Don't do it at eight or nine o'clock at night preferably, but I mean, during business hours, but pop in and have, have your questions ready to go, but come in unannounced, you know, how are they treating you when you first walk in the door? Um, Is someone readily available to meet with you? And who is that person? Um, Making sure that, you know, the whole leadership team is involved and not just the salesperson. Um, With our communities, we train the whole leadership team to be able to meet with families and, and whether they're the nurse or they're the activity director, you know, of course, they're going to be speaking highly on their specialty, but at least they they're able to meet with you and and give you a good idea of how the community runs, um, give you some examples, um, let you interact with residents and family members on the tour. I mean, I think that's that's huge. It's important. Um, Also asking to, you know, what is your leadership team? How how long have they been in the business? Um, What are their credentials? Um, how much experience is on the team? Um, how long have they been taking care of, of of residents, especially with dementia? I think that's a huge one. Once you cross into memory care, it's such a specialized need. Um, you know, what does that look like? Um, do they have a nurse on site 24-7? We have licensed nurses. That's a, that's a point of difference that Kelsch Communities has that our competitors don't. Um, I think there's one in the East Valley in Arizona, one other Um since COVID, um, it's been very a big challenge, but we've been able to to weather through it. And we do. We have a nurse on site, twenty four seven, licensed nursing. Um, but I think popping in unannounced is huge because you're really going to get it. You're really going to cu- catch them off guard and and see how they they interact when you pop in. So yes, I always I let think, families know that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Josh asked a question. Thanks yes. for clarifying. So memory care isn't necessarily for people who forget certain people's names. Um, or to take their meds, but are otherwise independent. So the to me, the way the way, what I do in recommending clients is that okay, first we've noticed that there's um, short term memory loss, right? So it isn't just I forgot someone's name because that'll come to you. It's like really embarrassing if you're you say 
you know, Paige, what's um, what's the name of the star for Top Gun? And you're like, oh, I can't remember his name. And then at three in the morning next to her husband, she yells, Tom Cruise. And right. so <laughs> who could forget Tom? We all, do, <laughs> we all do that. So um, uh, so forgetting people's names uh, it happens. Our brains in general shrink as we age. There's nothing we can do about that except for to stay hydrated. And so as a result, you're going to see some cognitive impairment. But if there's other things that are difficult, like remembering a doctor's appointment, well, then we have to give them tools, write things down, read the note after you have it. So we're enabling them to live independently as much as possible. But what's really nice about being in a community when you have, when you're old enough to have cognitive impairment related to age is that if you do forget your medication manage medications, then you just tell the director of nursing or, or director of care, hey, I could use some reminders for medication. Do you think we can add that to my plan? And you're just adding that one service. You're not, you know, you're not jumping into a package of things that you don't need. And so for memory care, um, that is really when uh, people are struggling with at least two activities of daily living. So uh, in mom's case, she couldn't talk. Um, and then she couldn't, uh, she was okay taking care of herself for a while. Uh, but then we just added that package, you know, hey, could you come in and help her, you know, make sure she's clean and help her get dressed a little bit. Because one of the things you start to notice when people have issues with cognitive um, uh, processing is that they might wear the same clothes two, three, four days in a row. Because when you they, back then, uh, with our silent generation, they would take the clothes off and put them on a chair or a bed and they should go in the hamper. And instead they just get up in the morning and they forget that that's the outfit they wore yesterday, not a new one. And they put it back on. And, you know, realistically one day isn't a big deal, but you know, you don't want things to, to get too ripe, um, in that, in that perspective. So it's nice to have a caregiver around to, to help with that page. Did you have any, uh, input on Josh's question? Yeah, Josh, I think totally, um, you know, that is a, a great comment and a good question. I think mom or your loved one, whoever you're talking about, I think she would be fine. And I think it, assisted living would be the best option for her. Um, not needing memory care at this point. Um, and once you step into the memory care realm, it would be where, you know, she's forgetting um, to go to meals. She's forgetting to um, like you, Pam, like you said, wearing the same clothes over and over. Maybe she's refusing care. Um, she's wandering out in the night, knocking on other people's doors, trying to get in. And she's confused on where she is. Maybe she's wandering out of the community and is getting lost. Those are our red flags. Okay. Maybe we need to move into more of a memory care type situation, but there are a lot of people that are in assisted living that that have minimal and moderate dementia, but are but are doing yep. fine in assisted and living. I prefer that. I prefer mm -hmm. that because that's a more stimulating environment for them. Uh, it's a different kind of stimulation, and and one of the the biggest challenges today in in the senior living community industry is what do you do with the person who has mild cognitive impairment, early stage dementia? they're not ready for memory care yet. And so that's right. why we were talking about assisted living with memory support. So mm -hmm. you'll get cues like, okay, it's breakfast time. Come on, let's make sure you're, you know, we, you're, you know, make sure you come down to breakfast. And then there's the next level of care, which is let's get you dressed and get you out of bed or, you know, whatever it is, brush your teeth, and then let's go down to breakfast. So more assistance, more time as affiliated with getting that person to where they need to be in order to maximize their health. So I think that's uh, really important. And we're, we're going to kind of, I want to skip to the, the question because of the title of the webinar, which is, what's it like to live in a senior living community? Um, do you want to take that one first, Paige, or do you want me to? You go ahead because you, you've had your parents. You go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> so so I was scared. I'll be very honest with you guys. I I was scared of dad's reaction. I, I don't, mom was far enough along in her, in her dementia journey that um, she was just happy to not, to have a place to eat and to not have to worry about dad fixing dinners and that type of thing. But she was, she was very impressed with all of the different services. 
Um, she liked the fact that they would go to a formal dining environment. So she, you know, for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And I, I'll tell you, the number one thing on her list, the ice cream machine. So <laughs> up until the time she lost her mobility, they had an ice cream machine outside of the dining room area. And the dining room doors are usually locked so that people just don't wander in and sit down. But it just depends on the community. And in that community, it was. And so uh, mom would just go over and get an ice cream cone. <laughs> <laughs> totally spoil our appetite. But, you know, and then when I would go to visit, I would bring my dog and um, the community that we were at when my dad was alive, uh, we would play pool and mom would sit and watch and, and pet the dog. So again, stimulation. And then on top of that, dad and I would be playing pool. So it was helping him move around, right. And, and move his, his body differently than he would typically. And um, it gave him an opportunity to take shots at me because I am a terrible pool player. And he's like, what were you thinking? And, and so it gave him a chance to laugh at me and enjoy the experience. Um, and then other communities that I've been at, like, oh, so when mom was at, at um, Rock Creek uh, in the memory care community, we would wheel around and I would, we would sing all the way around as we were wheeling. So you want a community that has space. Then mm -hmm. we'd go outside and we'd wander around in the gardens and I would pick flowers for her. Don't tell Kelsh I did that. Uh, <laughs> we'd pick flowers and she would hold them and, and, and she knew what to do with flowers, you know, so they're still in there. And so the fact that Kelsh thought about those things of, of experiential things, um, you know, she had a baby doll, the, couch, um, the memory care always has baby dolls and there's something nurturing about baby dolls and women with dementia. And they just feel like there's a, a chance to relive perhaps, um, that stage in their lives where they're caring and nurturing, because the biggest challenge that we have as we get older is keeping our purpose, having a purpose. And so without that purpose, it's very hard to get up in the morning. So one of the things that I compliment Kelsh on is making sure that everybody knows that they're, you know, they have a purpose, whether that's giving a gentleman a tape measure and letting him measure, you know, all the way around the community um, or, or giving a woman a baby doll because that's, you know, gives her that chance to be the a nurturing person. You know, that's ultimately what we're trying to get from living in a community. So that's my take on it. How about you? Well, as far as, you know, independent living, all different levels of care is, is going to be socialization, love and care and compassion. Um, you're going to find the safety and security above and beyond um, independent living. You're going to have your high active um, activities, lots of uh, organic relationships going on, um, exceptional food, um, your assisted living, you're going to have all of that, but you're going to have the care component um, and you're going to have the care staff, more care staff and memory care. You're going to have a lot of socialization and stimulation socially throughout the day. Lots mm -hmm. of things, lots of routine going on. Um, we're guiding them through the, the different aspects of their life hour to hour throughout the day you know, bathing, dre dressing, care in between, but also a lot of activities and a lot of, of social integration, um, but a well, lot so of care, love, and compassion. You mentioned love. So um, one of the caregivers that took care of mom is still at, well, this is 12 years later, she's still at Rock Creek. And mm -hmm. so I went back and uh, I was so surprised to see her and she gave me a big hug because the thing that I noticed about the caregivers at Rock Creek were that they would always stroke my mom's back or they'd tell her how beautiful she looked after she come out of the hair salon that was there. And it was, it was truly, they were tuned in. And one of the things as a caregiver, as a daughter that I had to kind of adjust to is they loved her as much as I did. And she loved them she knew who they were and, and she would flirt with the gentlemen caregivers and, and, um, and pat the, the women on the hand. And it, it was, it's like a family. And so when Stephanie said, we're your support team and your, and your, your family now mm -hmm. it's, it's true, but I will tell you, not every community is like that. 
And so these are the things that we're sharing with you that you need to look for in whatever community that you're looking at. Absolutely. Okay? Yes. Does anybody have any more questions? Because we're coming up on the top of the hour. Uh, Paige, I think we've, oh, well, how about, um, we might cover that quick one is, how long is, how, how do you know uh, that you've picked the right community? What what are the time frames you, you move in or you move your loved one in? What are the time frames? What do you recommend? Um, well, when you're needing assisted and memory care, um, it's usually pretty quick. Uh, independent, of course, is a little bit longer, but I think how long does it take when you know you pick the right place? Right. I think that's going to be, that's all in your gut. Once you, once you feel it and you know, you've picked the right place, it's usually best that you probably should move forward because, you know, I have people that come to us all the time and they came, I didn't go seek them out. They came to me for a reason. Yeah. And why yeah. did they come to me for a reason? Because they're concerned or they're worried about their loved ones. So, I always say, you know, once you find the right place, um, you know, go ahead and make the decision. Sooner is smarter. So is it, smarter. that's the the decision part. But so, for instance, when uh, what I tell my clients is, well, we just moved mom into assisted living and she hates it. Well, she's going to probably be in transition. So I don't know how many times you guys have moved, but every time I move, I'm exhausted so you, first of all, when you when you move into any, whether it's independent, assisted, or memory care, there is at least, a, in my opinion, 45 to 60 day transition period for everybody. That's not just for the person who moved, it's for you. You're having to get used to seeing other people caring for your loved one, uh, getting used to the processes that caregivers are trying to understand and get to know your loved one. Um, you know, everybody's, you know, trying to adjust. So give that 60 days. Now, if mom is still complaining, then then you do a deeper dive with someone like me or Paige, where you say, okay, what kind of complaints are we getting? And it might be that mom just is still adjusting to, wow, I'm I'm not, I'm not back at my house, but I am enjoying the art classes and I am enjoying the music and the food, but I don't like so and so. Well, okay, so we we can manage keeping her away from so and so. You, so, so my, my key point here is when, after you make your decision and you move in, do not make another decision for at least 60 days. Do not decide, oh, well, they've been in there for three weeks and they hate it. You mm -hmm. know, uh, if there was an event that created a need to move, that's a conversation that everybody needs to have together to find out, is this going to happen again? Or, or are there issues? But uh, never, you want to avoid moving people too often because it's disorienting. And every time you move, you have to go through this transition. So Paige, what are your thoughts? Well, yeah, the transition, absolutely. You know, I would say at least, you know, at least 60 days, if not 90 days, but also too, that your loved one's always going to make you feel the worst because you yep. are the one that you're the closest to. Um, yep. I have a lady that moved into memory care and um, her name was Corrine and she's passed away years ago, but gosh, she was one of our high functioning, always busy play was always in all the activities, got everyone going. She was, I mean, she was just amazing, high functioning and, and, and was very, very active. And then she'd get on the phone with her daughter and go, oh my gosh, this is, this is the worst place ever. You've got to come and get me out of here. And then I turn around and go, Corrine, you are full of it. Yeah. I said, you, and she'd get off the phone. She'd go, I know, but I need to make my daughter feel really bad. And I'd say, oh, don't do that, you know, and she and she'd get off the phone. And so I recorded her <laughs> and showed it to her daughter. And she's like, I, you know, and then I would record her while she's in the community. And she's like, I knew she was doing OK. And I'm like, I know, but they're the worst to the ones they love the most. Yep, it's yeah. very true. So yeah. that's part of what I do with my consulting services is to help you guys through that sense of guilt and and balance. Right. And how do you respond to someone who does something like that? And the, the, especially in memory care, you can, you can prod them a little bit and say, well, what exactly happened? Oh, I don't know. I just, you know, and, and the, it really is, it's that adjustment period um, where they want to get as much attention as possible. And yep. it's a thing. So heads up guys, if you need support, reach out um, again, I'll put my, my email in here, but you will have it. Uh, you already do. If you've got reminders uh, and you'll also get the recording, um, that's interesting. Um, <laughs> so uh, if you if you need help, 
Pam at it's not that simple.com page is, is the regional director of community relations uh, at Kelsch. And we are here to support you. That's the whole purpose behind it. So um, if anybody does, no one uh, have any additional questions, we'll, we'll wrap up otherwise. I want to thank you all for joining and hopefully you'll see us uh, again on October 5th. October 5th, because we're going to, this is really important, guys, documents you need to have yes. prior to moving into senior living. And one of them, if you live in Arizona, is the Arizona Mental Health uh, Document, because it's not the same as your mental, uh, of your healthcare power of attorney. They're two separate documents and you need to have both. So yeah. uh, we will, we will be talking about that on October 5th. So thank you guys for coming. And thank Paige, you thank you again. I appreciate it. Thank you, Pam. And we will see you guys soon. Take right. care. Good night. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.